if you're going to reach out to a prospect and you want to have success in that outreach, you know, one of the first things, a critical thing that you have to do is make sure that your outreach is not just getting lost in the noise, right? And what is the best way to do that? It's to show that person that you know something about them. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Well, welcome back to our next episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is someone I'm looking forward to sharing the mic with. He's led sales and operations for multiple hyper-growth venture-backed tech companies. He's a dedicated leader who is passionate about seeing sales professionals succeed, co-founder and CRO of Sales Assembly, an elevated learning and development platform for the go-to-market teams of B2B tech companies. I'm here with Matt Green. Matt, great to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tim. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it's a fun discussion. I'm, I started off with kind of, are you interested in discussing this whole whole deal around EQ and where it's impacting sales? And, you know, to jump right into it, in the world of B2B sales, what is that one soft skill that you see creating an impact on relationships, especially in this remote world? And also, we all have to come back to this drive revenue. Yeah, I think, um, you know, with, with those with those factors in mind, if I had to highlight just one soft skill, it'd be empathy. You know, any day of the week. Um, yeah, empathy, admittedly, relatively broad. I mean, there's a lot that you can unpack from that, but whether it is just building authentic relationships or it's your point, building relationships as part of the process of driving revenue, I think empathy is always going to be key. Well, and, and empathy is so core to human connection. You know, we just got on this, I'll, I'll joke a little bit, atmospheric river going through California yet again. And, and I was saying, hey, not necessarily the best setup, but puts you in the shoes of a seller, puts you in the shoes of somebody that whether something's going on in the background or not, I've got to show up, I've got to meet my buyer where they are, I've got to build that connection. And, and you showed some amazing empathy to me today. So putting it into action, Matt, how are you seeing sales teams put that squishy topic or that that idea of empathy into action? Yeah, I think that the the best sales teams, the best sales people that that I know that are really putting this into action will, you know, again, when you talk about empathy, you could go down a couple different rabbit holes, but piggybacking off of some things that that you just said, one in particular, forming, uh, good human connections, right? Which is something that any sales professional wants to do with a prospect or a client. Where does that start and how does this tie back into empathy? I think a large part, it starts with communication, right? And, you know, communication, just like empathy, it's like, okay, that's relatively broad. So let's unpack that a little bit. I'm not just talking about communication, like the words that, that we say to each other, but part of communication is also listening right? You know, active listening, you know, that's what leads salespeople to become more empathetic in nature and leverage that soft skill of empathy. You know, they practice and they pride themselves on being expert communicators, not just explaining things to prospects and potential clients, but just as if not more importantly, um, focusing on active listening to really put themselves in the shoes of the person that they're talking to. Right. And then again, you could go down a couple different lanes as far as like, okay, well, how do you show up for this communication? Are you sitting or are you standing? Right. You know, if you're communicating over email, how are you communicating over email? How quickly are you responding to emails when prospects or clients email you? Right. So it could go down a couple different roads as you can imagine. But I think all that feeds into communication. And again, communication being one of the biggest parts, biggest components of how. Um, sales professionals and sales leaders can leverage empathy to build really strong relationships with people that they're uh, that they're communicating with. Well, Matt, you said something that's interesting because people don't often think of empathy in email or in some of the communication channels, right? 
we think of it when we're face to face, when we get to hear something and, and really gauge their, their emotion, their body language and respond. But the, the thing that just went off for me is that quick response is really showing how much you care. It's putting yourself in the shoes of that buyer saying, let me get you that answer right away. Because if I'm going to move this deal forward, if you're going to do, a, you know, help me move this deal forward, I need to enable you. And it's really thinking ahead of it, like, wow, you, you're, you are, you're putting their needs in front of your own when you might be busy making more cold calls or reaching out to that next prospect or, or taking that next meeting taking that extra time to follow up and, and follow through on those next steps. I want to talk a little bit about email in general and where you see it playing in today's sales engagement and kind of open it up in, in that theme of communication because empathy and, and EQ is really easy when we're face-to-face. But in the reality of today, most sales are happening online. How has that shifted and, and what's that look like? What are the skills you're seeing become more and more needed in the sales kind of role as we're in this video environment? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think that there is a way to tie that back to, um, you know, to, to the larger topic, the larger theme of empathy a, a, as this core soft skill, right? So let's talk about, to your point a moment ago, communicating in person or like we're doing now, you know, at least visually, right. You know, e- even though it's done, done virtually, you know, we can play off each other. We could read each other's tone and, you know, what does that serve as a function of just getting to know like, Hey, here's who Tim is as a person, as an individual, right. Here, and here's how we're going to communicate with each other. Um, although it's not exactly apples to apples, right? I think that when you're communicating async, right, communicating via email, there's still a whole lot of um, there's still a whole lot of nuggets that a sales professional can pick up um, uh, from. You know, a perfect example would be I'm sure that many people listening to this podcast right now, or at least I hope that they are, uh, follow a woman named Sam McKenna on LinkedIn, you know, she has the, this really amazing uh, phrase, show me, you know me, right? So if you're going to reach out to a prospect and you want to have success in that outreach, you know, one of the first things, a critical thing that you have to do is make sure that your outreach is not just getting lost in the noise, right? And what is the best way to do that? It's to show that person that you know something about them, right? So tying all this back together, as far as your question, email, Right in showing empathy, doing research on the yes. person that uh, that you're looking to to affect some type of outreach to, and not just where he or she went to school. That's kind of table stakes, right? But for example, I was on a call with somebody this uh, this morning. It, it was the first conversation that, that we've ever had. We didn't we weren't introduced by anybody. It was you know a fact through a cold outreach and just through taking five minutes of poking around on his LinkedIn profile. I found out that he's really passionate about pizza, right? And he spends a lot of time, you know, um, actually cooking and making his own pizza. You know, as a background in, you know, culinary school before he got into, you know, this weird little world of, of B2B tech sales. So as you can imagine, you know, when I first initiated my initial outreach to him, you know, the first thing, the first um, thing that he saw in the subject line and the first line in the initial email had to do with the topic of pizza. Right. I'd ask him like, hey, look, you know, before we get into a conversation, I have to know if we're going to get along. Right. You know, I think that Neapolitan, best style of pizza. Right. Let's make sure that this is going to be, you know, a productive conversation that we're actually going to have something in common. Let me ask you, you know, your thoughts, you know, Neapolitan, New York style, Chicago deep dish. What is it? Um, fortunately, he agreed that Neapolitan was number one. Right. But, you know, that right there, just that one example. I like to think is a halfway decent example of how empathy can and should be instituted when uh, you're communicating even asynchronously, right? It's, you know, reaching out to the person as a human being rather than just the prospect that you want to sell something to. I I have to say, this is echoing one of our last episodes with uh, Joe Venuti. He shared a story of an SDR that, uh, the, the guy kind of flippantly said, yeah, well, I'll take the meeting when you send me a Ferrari. 
And I think part of empathy, and we talked a little bit of this in our prep call, is that combination of listening and caring and then getting creative. Because his example, the guy didn't want an actual Ferrari. I mean, sure, probably would have taken it. But he was basically saying, you know, if you really wow me over the moon and you show me that you care, maybe I'll take your call, right? Yours with the pizza. I think it's the same analogy. It's like, if you can have that conversation and it's not just in it for a transaction, like I want to work with you. I want to learn who you are, get to know you and help your organization because I think I can help. I think that comes across in spades in a world where how many times are we getting the perfect, perfect email sent to us and the perfect template and it just gets deleted every single time. Yeah. And and just, you know, I love that example that you shared about the SDR. It's just for what it's worth, what I would have done right there if I was the SDR would have gone out. I would have expensed $2 on the company budget, bought a little Ferrari Hot Wheels, mailed it to the guy with uh, with a card, with a handwritten card saying, hey, now you got to take my down. Right. You know, it's, you know, it's just small touches like that. And I, you know, I don't know for sure, but I, I like to think that the recipient of that Ferrari would have gotten that, read the card and to your point, say like, okay, this person gets me right. At least to a certain extent, at the very least, it's going to be worth an exploratory conversation. Well, and that's where it leads. And, and, you know, I got engaged with on LinkedIn recently, uh, a gentleman reached out. I have little things as cork door because I love wine. And so reached out. And I don't want somebody send me a bottle of wine. I don't want to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm obligated to not do something. So it was a great opening. He said, hey, you say you're a cork dork. I have my family coming over for XYZ event or whatever else. Can you recommend three bottles of wine? Now, this is the prospect SDR. I know he's an SDR or somebody reaching out to me, but I'm like smiling and giddy because Mm -hmm. throughout all my day of Excel spreadsheets and meetings and whatever it might be, Oh, I'm going to carve out five minutes to go connect with this person, give them some wine recommendations and connect. Just because, again, I think we all crave, and and I think the COVID taught us this, we all crave that human connection. And we've got to be able to now figure out how to do it over so many different channels. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's another great example. Reminds me of an SDR. This was about a year ago, reached out to me. And buried deep in my LinkedIn profile, you know, in the about me section, you know, I mentioned it's like an offhand remarks that I'll, I'll beat anybody in a, a Simpsons quoting competition. Right? And then, you know, this SDR, you know, what he did, he reached out to me, you know, the subject line is like, you know, challenge accepted, right? And the, the only line in the email is like, he's like, dude, you know, I, I challenge you to, you know, to a Simpson quoting competition, you know, if I win, if I throw a quote by you and, you know, on on the phone. So I can't, so you can't cheat and Google which episode it came from. If you're not able to identify it, then you got to take a demo with me. Right. And, you know, number one, you know, just me, I'm like, okay, well challenge accepted, right. Let's do this thing. But again, to your point, just the creativity, right? Like, okay, I'm, I'm connecting with another human. They are showing a level of empathy where they're trying to get to know me as an individual. Those are the types of relationships that people are going to want to invest in across the board. Uh, it's it's interesting because now, and, and this is where I think it all comes full circle, all of those things are great in a perfect environment or when you have time. Now, economies have shrunk. Things are getting tougher. There's more noise in the market than ever before. Do you see this being kind of that differentiating piece that comes next? Do you see other technologies, other things coming in there? I mean, I, I just happen to feel like we're on the precip of if everybody can send content through chat GPT and have the same basic email in two seconds, then this human aspect's got to be the emerging aspect that people have to focus on. Yeah. I, um, I don't know for sure. I would bet good money on, on that, that, that they're, that the most successful salespeople and sales teams are going to overcorrect away from leveraging chat GPT and, you know, just sending more emails, you know, trying for more touches. So like, okay, well, let, let's not focus more on building a bigger pipeline, right? Necessarily, let's focus more on making the best of the pipeline that we have, right? Especially mm-hmm. in the short term. Um, so what is going to be a, a big part of that? And you alluded to it a, a moment ago, is going to be like the actual human to human connection, um, ideally in person. 
right? You know, I think that is going to be a big area of opportunity for sales teams that are looking to differentiate themselves in the market, looking to separate themselves from the noise, actually taking the time to meet their prospects in person and not necessarily at a trade show, right? Or, or a big conference where everyone gathers, um, but just finding an opportunity to do that ad hoc. Um, I think that the struggle that some salespeople and sales teams might have if they wanted to go down this road, and if this does uh, prove out to be true, is that a lot of salespeople right now, you know, if they started their career in 2019, um, as BDRs, SDRs, and you know now they're account executives of the companies that they work with. They've never had to do stuff in person, right? They've never had the opportunity to do stuff in person. Um, so you know that muscle memory, so to speak, ha- hasn't ever been built, right? You know, all they know is thirty-minute Zoom interactions, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know like, okay, well, if I'm going to buy a prospect a cup of coffee or take him or her out to dinner or spend time at a happy hour. A lot of them, as weird as it might sound to folks that are a little bit older, like you and I, um, never operated in that environment before and therefore don't really know how to do it. That's an interesting challenge. And do you see, I mean, you have a pulse on so many companies and we'll get more to this, but you talk to 200 plus CROs every single month, which your pulse on what's going on in these companies is, is tremendous. Do you see internal training programs? Do you see what's the what the mentorship? What are the ways companies are kind of working through that? Because that's a really interesting talent challenge that you're you're bringing up. Yeah, we. It's funny. So I had lunch with with one of our uh, the president of one of our uh, member companies yesterday, and we spoke about this exact thing. They um, they've been trying to encourage their team to do more and more in person. There's some hesitation, and initially. They presumed that it was because like, oh, well, you know, travel challenges, you know, people like working from home and this, that, and the other thing. But once they dug a little bit deeper and had some transparent conversations with the salespeople on their team, they're just nervous, right? You know, they, because again, they, their entire career has been emails and Zooms, right? They don't know how to have a meaningful interaction with a prospect in person that is not confined to a 30 minute Zoom link. Um, so uh, again, at least from our vantage point, we see a lot of companies that have come to this realization relatively recently, right? Uh Why is it all relatively recently at the same time? Because when the economy shifted, you know, six, seven months ago, top of funnels started getting lighter. And then, you know, that just coincided with chat GPT and, you know, everybody being able to spray and pray, you know, as often as they wanted. You know, that mm-hmm. coincided with just the timing of companies saying like, okay, let's do more stuff in person, yeah. right? Now they're all just starting to realize that, hey, maybe our team isn't equipped to this. So we're seeing, we're at the very early stages of seeing companies make investments in things um, like improv training, um, storytelling, you know, things like that, core competencies that maybe you and I have picked up just by doing over the course mm-hmm. of our careers, but a lot of these folks haven't been exposed to before. Well, and talk about communication and soft skills. I mean, those are things that in a curriculum, like we were talking to Florida State University's sales excellence and and one of their sales innovation, and it's now a full degree program. And one of the things they were talking about was the amount of improvisation and the amount of back and forth in the classroom they have with both expert panels and peer evaluations. So there's, there's got to be something to this whole face-to-face interactions, not only in training, but also in your interact in your engagements to move deals forward. Where are you seeing that travel shift though? I always felt like it was right at the beginning of the trade show and kind of, oh, big, wow, wow, big fireworks. Okay, great. Everyone comes back from that. Then we get to work on the leads and don't meet with any of these people. But you've seen that, I think, kind of shift a little bit. Yeah, we, we have seen it shift and, and a lot of it is due to um, marketing budgets just, you know, becoming tighter across the board. So what we see a lot of companies doing and having success with it, it's less about a big presence of trade shows. And a lot of it is just finding small ways to piggyback off of the trade shows, off of the conferences, right? So we're not going to become a big sponsor. We're not going to have a big booth and, you know, spend all the incremental costs that comes along with putting together presence 
at a big conference. But if we know that a whole lot of our ICP are going to be in Austin, New York, San Francisco, San Diego at the same time, whenever the case may be, let's find either a, you know, creative way to get small, you know, smaller bespoke groups of our prospects together for one-off events. Or, you know, if we really want to save on costs and just test things out, let's just send a salesperson or two to set up just back-to-back coffees, lunches, and dinners. And Again, just leverage the opportunity that everyone's going to be in a similar geographical area at a similar time as a method to say like, great, let me just find some time to connect with you again, 45 to 60 minutes, human to human in person. I think it's a a great way to move things that I hear constantly of. We talk to somebody, they're interested, they love the opportunity of, of this solution or this, you know, working with you on X, Y, Z. Oh, we're in stage two, stage three, and and we can't seem to move this deal forward. Yeah, it, that seems to be that sweet spot where a little bit of human interaction and maybe a Zoom call. You know, to your point, everybody's been selling over Zoom. But we've also been buying over Zoom. It's a lot easier for me to, you know, turn off the camera and become disengaged three or four meetings into it when I'm over Zoom than if I'm sitting down with you and having a cup of coffee. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, coincidentally, that's something that we're doing here internally at at sales assembly. We, you know, we've always placed a big emphasis on in-person interaction, but it's kind of in our our DNA. Um, But even now from a prospecting and a sales perspective, um, you know, we're making investments, you know, on, on a monthly basis, just flying around to different areas across country where we know if we could have five, six, seven, eight meetings, in San Francisco and mm-hmm. York and Austin, whatever the case may be, it's definitely going to be worth the the trip out there. Um, so what we're really looking at now is like, okay, well, where within the sales process is that money and time going to be best spent? Is it really going to be best spent at the top of the funnel, just forging that initial connection? Or does it make sense to connect with someone over Zoom to your point, get them stage two, stage three? And then it's like, great, you know, midway through the sales process, right? That's when it makes sense for us to go out there and meet a, a potential uh, buyer in person. Some that we're going to be A, B testing and looking at the data around really closely over the next couple of months. It, it'd be interesting to see that because in the buying process, I feel like everybody comes in very optimistic, very excited. Oh, new solution. I want to solve this problem. I've got all the gusto to do it. And by about that third conversation, I find it. Oh, this is going to make a lot of changes in our organization. Oh, this is going to be painful. It's kind of that, like that little trough of despair sort of thing. And and maybe at that point, like you're saying, that's that inflection point to kind of bring that back up, um, reinvigorate the conversation that tough to do sometimes over Zoom. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it could, you know, provided that that your solution is compelling, that it does make sense, um, that it's going to be a a good fit for the client's needs, which of course is always the number one, two, and three priority, Um, provided that you have a good use case. then yeah, you know, I like to think, and again, jury's still out. We're going to be tracking the data here internally at sales assembly. Um, But you'd like to think that inserting that in-person face-to-face connection could be to your point, like a shot of B12. Right. Yep. You know, it gets, gets the entire process reinvigorated and hopefully moves them over the finish line sooner rather than later. Yeah. And, and it builds that again, that connection and a little bit more trust and rapport that I feel is lacking or, or we've, we've heard from buyers and sellers on both sides lacks a little bit in different environments. So with these 200 plus CROs that you're talking to, I want to dig into this because I think you've got some great insights on, we know it's noisy. We know there's more content getting pushed than ever before. How are you hearing your peers break through the noise? You know, getting face-to-face is one option, but for organizations that maybe can't do that, what are some other um, tactics or or stories that you've heard of to break through? Yeah. um, You know, number one is, uh, as mentioned before, a lot of folks that they are really starting to double down on events. And again, you know, not necessarily being a part of the event itself, but doing things around events, again, just as a find a way, find a way to, to make face-to-face interactions. Um, but another thing that, that we see a lot of is companies taking sort of a less is more 
approach to, to prospecting, right? You know, really focusing in on like, okay, well, filling the, the top of the funnel is important, right? But again, we all know that there's just endless noise out there, regardless, you know, even if you're a buyer or not, right? You know, if you work for a company, you're probably getting lit up by SDRs, you know, through email, through DMs, you know, what, whatever the case may be. So you, we see a lot of companies that are taking sort of a mindset shift and saying like, okay, well, let's again, focus less on filling the, the top of the funnel, more about taking what is already in the funnel and spending a whole lot more time being thoughtful around like, okay, you know, how are we going to message to this particular prospect, right? You know, how are we going to connect with them? How are we going to show value? And sure, you know, the sales cycle might take a little bit longer, or in some cases, a hell of a lot longer than they did a year ago, right? For all the various obvious reasons, but it's probably going to be time and money much better spent if we take the folks that have already had some sort of meaningful interaction with us, even if that interaction is relatively tenuous and they just downloaded an ebook, came to a webinar, whatever the case may be, and focused in on those, right? Rather than you know, trying them a couple of times with something really tertiary and high level, saying like, oh, it didn't work, let's go find two or three replacements. It's no, let's take the relationships that we already have, even if they are extremely weak, and double down on those to make sure that we're doing whatever we can to move those prospects through the funnel. I like the approach you're taking of building traction over just, I, I kind of liken it to growing carrots, right? We put the seeds in the ground, we see the little sprouts start to pop up. And I think for the last 15 years, marketing and sales has been all about pull them up right when you see something great, right? Doesn't matter what's underneath there, let's just pull them and we'll get a few carrots in the, in the mix, but we'll throw a lot out in the process. In a world now where content, you're worried to download it because God help what happens after you download that PDF. Um, and, and the conversion rates of those are so low. I think there was a report out that was like 2% of content downloads ever convert into an opportunity. There's got to be a little bit more focus in, in going after what's real and what's there and spending less time on the noise that's coming into the seller then as well. I mean, is that, that a good idea in terms of like when you envision this strategy playing out, it's that seller more focusing on really strong intent signals rather than just kind of tertiary little interactions or blips. And I think before we were looking for everything. Yeah. Before we were looking for, for everything, but now, yeah, companies that they're really honing in on uh, exactly what you just said, the intent signals, not just a, but multiple intense signals. And, um, you know, to your point a moment ago, taking down the gate, making sure that people aren't afraid to download that, that ebook for fear of what might happen. Right. And, and, you know, focusing on, and a lot of companies, you know, got ahead of this way, you know, way ahead of the game. Um, but focusing on like, Hey, we're just going to provide value to the ecosystem and, you know, no gates, no, no forms, nothing like that. Just value, value, value. And as long as we provide enough value to the right types of people, um, they are going to get to a point. And as long as we have a mechanism set up to track that intent, right. You know, we are going to get to a point where the intent data, you know, that's going to inform our sales outreach strategy, right. You know, we know of a lot of organizations that have built their entire sales process and sales organization just around intent, identifying those signals and making sure that as long as um, a prospect doesn't hit, doesn't check like these four or five boxes on the intent spectrum, if you want to call it that, not even worth the time, right? We're not even going to bother trying to do any sort of outreach to this person. Let's focus on filling this intent bucket that you might call it and really just hone in on those, even though the size of the pool might be smaller than it would be otherwise. It goes back to that year of efficiency or effectiveness, right? That we've heard hearkened through so many organizations and kind of coined in this year. It's not productivity. And I, I think a lot of people hear effectiveness and they think more, more, more. It's more about what's my hit ratio. And I think that's been pretty dismal for a long time in both marketing and sales, right? Those numbers, like you look at some of the conversion rates on things and you go, that is a very small percentage and still making this whole system run. Um, 
I like that shift. It leads me to asking you, you know, you came on this podcast, we're talking about EQ as kind of that underlying message underneath what's moving businesses forward. For you, Matt, why EQ and, and why now? Oh, it's a good question. Um, why EQ? You know, I, I think part of it is just the the way that I'm built and that, you know, just what I've seen in my personal career, what has allowed me to be successful, um, you know, relatively speaking, it, it, at least, um, you know, that sort of answers it. your second question, why now, at least for me, it's always been this way. Um, and, you know, that's why I get excited might be the, the wrong term, but as the companies that we work with and just companies across the ecosystem writ large as they start talking about more things in person and training people up on, you know, um, skills like improv and storytelling so that they can forge like actual meaningful relationships with mm -hmm. prospects and clients that they work with. That's why I get excited because that's always been my jam. Um, and to be clear, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm the best salesperson far from it. Right. Um, you know, that just has always been the way that I've always sold. Um, going back to when I first started, you know, selling stuff back in God, 2004. Right. Um, and it just happens to coincide that right now at this time, given all the externalities, right. You know, this kind of stuff, EQ empathy, as we spoke about earlier is becoming much more important in order to just get, get deals done. Right, compared mm -hmm. to a year, eighteen months ago, where if you at if you're an SDR or an AE and your team had a halfway decent cadence, chances are, depending on the demographic that you sold into, you're hitting somebody with budget, and sale might have been relatively easy. Right, you know, now it's a whole different ball game. As it's changed, and as there's more, I see kind of approvals and oversight. Does that EQ component, that trust? To me, my bet is that becomes more critical in moving the deal forward, hands down. Yeah, yeah, e easily, um, especially when, you know, as you mentioned a moment ago, um, more layers of approval, you know, the CFO essentially being the final and maybe sole decision maker on any sort of spend. Um, what do you need to, if you're not selling a product that's directly going to benefit a CFO, which many of us don't, what do you need in order to get the sale done? You need champions, right? How are you going to build champions? You got to build trust, right? And you have to do it in a variety of different ways and being able to build so much trust to an extent that that champion is willing to put his or her internal social capital on the line to go to the CFO and say like, hey, we need this solution, right? And let me tell you why. And that's a big lift. I mean, that is for somebody internally to commit to that. When we put that out there, the way you just framed it, I think you said it better than, than I've ever heard it. You've got to put your social capital on the line to move this forward. It's not the seller anymore. It's that individual, that internal champion. Yeah. And I think that's where we've all gotten to in a lot of these deals. It, it doesn't get done from the seller just working externally. It, it, there's so much complexity, especially selling into the enterprise or in large organizations. If you don't have those champions to to fix the internal piece, you'll never get it moved forward. Or twelve months from now, it won't be used, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, not, yeah. Neither one of those are, are, are ideal. Yeah. So, so Matt, you know, take me back a little bit. I, I want to go back to your history. You know, you talked about when you were first starting selling. Give me a little background to to little Matt, kind of where where you started and what brought you into sales assembly. Yeah. So I, you know, it's funny, I think back, I, I was, you know, even when I was a teenager, um, parking cars, you know, you collect tips, right. I, I've never really had a job that wasn't in some way, shape or form, um, you know, commission based. Um, but you know, the long and short of it is after, uh, I graduated from, from college, um, I got into, um, wealth management, which that industry is just all sales, you know, much of it, you know, my first few years, uh, worked in a very boiler roomish type of environment, like very, you know, the, that scene in, in the movie boiler room when Ben Affleck is interviewing, you know, the 
30 or 40 people that, that just wandered in off the street. That was my first interview, right? Um, you know, <laughs> very similar to that. 300 cold calls a day, six days a week, you know, even came in on, on Saturday, you know, from nine to 12 in order to do cold calls then. Um, so what was brought up in that type of environment, um, eventually, you know, found my way into working with a, uh, with a venture back tech startup, uh, here in, in Chicago, um, helping to, to lead seal, uh, lead sales there. Um, I had met my partner, my now partner, Jeff, um, uh, a few years prior to when I started working in tech sales, we met serving on the board of the same charity. Um, you fast forward a couple of years, you know, Jeff has this great idea for sales assembly. He and I come together. He's like, great, you know, let's launch this. And, you know, we've been doing this for about six years now. And to your point, as you mentioned a few times, working as of today with around 200 or so B2B software companies. That's tremendous growth story. So what was the initial idea and how has it transformed since? Yeah, the, the initial idea was, um, you know, one, one of the things that, that we used to do way back in the day before sales assembly was a thing was we would, on a bi-monthly basis, bring sales leaders of what at the time were early stage Chicago tech companies together for a coffee every other month um, and just chat about what we're working on and what we're struggling with, right, as sales leaders. And in that room, you had, again, the sales leaders at the time, really small companies like Sprout Social, G2, ShipBob, you know, yeah. Active Campaign, you know, companies that, that have obviously scaled to, you know, significant degree today. And, you know, one thing that, that we noticed is that regardless of the sales leader, the product that their company sold, who they sold it to, they were always complaining about the exact same stuff. Right. You know, and a lot of it had to do with number one, best practice sharing for them as leaders, but just yeah. as importantly, they were building their teams, hiring a lot of people. Okay. How do we train and develop all these yeah. folks that were bringing on board in a scalable manner? Right. Um, and that eventually, um, you know, when you take a look at what sales assembly has evolved to today, as you mentioned at the top, you know, we provide uh, learning and development for the go to market teams of all these B2B software companies that we work with while also we have this really cool component where everything that we do is enhanced by community, right? So that we provide not only the sales leaders, but also all the individual contributors, the CS leaders, the account managers, rev ops, enablement, all of these great folks up and down the go-to-market teams, the opportunity to connect and collaborate with each other for the exact same reason back, you know, 2016, just to share ideas and best practices and talk about what they're working on and what they're struggling with. When community seems to be not only a superpower of organizations that have harnessed it early. So I think of, of your organization and the fact that that was kind of where sales assembly started and you've maintained and probably drastically grown that community over time it seems to be where a lot of deals are getting done. And a lot of conversations are happening to start deals or to figure out solutions and then a sales opportunity comes out of it simply because of just a good conversation where you're trying to solve a challenge. Is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah. It, you know, time is all back together to just human, human connections and relationship. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned at the top of this conversation, one of the things that we do here is every month we have a standing zoom call, just like this for all the VPs of sales and CROs uh, of all the companies that, that we work with. And, the format and agenda is very much the same as it was back in 2016 and that there is none, right? You all show up, you chat with your counterparts that are all building B2B software companies regarding like, hey, here's what's going on in my world. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Um, people do not sell to each other. And we, you know, we have strict guidelines around that. But as you can imagine, if you have a sales leader from company A and a sales leader from company B that see each other every month and are always helpful to each other, and it just so happens that sales leader from company A, his company or her company has a solution that sales leader from company B, you know, it's like, oh, wow, this would really solve my problem, right? We see a whole lot of people within the sales assembly ecosystem doing business with each other, which we love. We love the yeah. fact that it just comes out, again, of those authentic peer-to-peer -peer connections, right? And just that relationship building as we'd spoken about before. 
Well, and it, it goes back to before all of this technology, if I was looking for, I always remember, you know, your, your dad or your mom had their buddies, their friends. And if you said, oh, you know, you need a whatever service it whatever was, you go in the little Rolodex and, oh, yep, call this person or call. That's kind of what a lot of these communities have been now for a lot of organizations at a bigger scale. Yeah. Because it's that trusted person they can talk to. Maybe I don't go with that person, but hey, I've got this person in the industry I can learn and talk to. I, I think that's it's tremendous. And on the flip side, it goes back to our conversation on EQ because if you come into those communities hot and trying to sell, it never works. Yeah. But if you come in to give and add value and to offer your support and your expertise, amazing what can come from it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what excites you about the future, Matt? You guys just finished messaging, different transitions over at Sales Assembly. What's something that's really getting you excited about uh, in the coming year? Ooh, um, continuing to, uh, you know, the very high level, simple as it sounds, continuing to uh, to grow. You know, we've been fortunate enough to um, to grow to pretty consistent pace and a pretty rapid pace over the past five and a half years. Um, but you know, really how does that growth come about? It's just by adding more value, right? And and especially now as tough decisions have been made at a lot of the companies, um, you know, budgets have been cut, staffing has been cut. Um, there still is a need for the ongoing training development, um, especially around these core competencies like storytelling, as we spoke about before negotiation tactics, you know, things like that for the revenue teams and the sales enablement leaders that we partner with at all these companies, a lot of them are struggling, right? Because like every other department, they now have a lack of budget. So what we're most excited about this year is, you know, just continue growing by adding more and more value from the skill development and training perspective to the companies that we work with across the ecosystem. Well, I'm excited to seeing more of your content on LinkedIn. Definitely looking forward to hopefully finding you face-to-face a few different times. And for, for our listeners, if anyone's in the Chicago area, you know, where can they maybe catch Matt? What are some things you like to do outside of work? Or uh, you know, don't give up your favorite pizza place or any of those. You might, you might have long lines to deal with. But <laughs> what are some of your, uh, your passions outside the sales assembly? Yeah, well, Savor Pizza Place, because he asked, is uh, Flo and Santos, a uh, small place down in the South Loop in Chicago, if people are familiar. But yeah, I mean, outside of sales assembly, um, you know, I'm, I'm relatively boring. The only thing that, uh, that my wife and son and I do that's in any way, shape or form exciting is we travel a lot, you know, hence the, uh, hence the map uh, behind me. Uh, for those of you that, uh, that are watching this um, on, on video, um, yeah, so if you don't find me working, you probably find me, you know, being in an unfortunate position to, you know, taking my son and my wife places uh, just cross country, across the world, and getting a sense of different cultures, you know, different lifestyles, and you know, just making sure that my son has the opportunities that I didn't have when I was his age. That's tremendous. I, as someone who loves to travel himself, I, you know, the culture, the amount of openness, the things that you learn about yourself and about the world when you're out there. It's an amazing thing to have and, and a gift to give your son. So tremendous to see it, Matt, and, and to catch up. I, I am still going to, I want to get you on one of these Simpsons quotes. I, I unfortunately don't know the Simpsons well enough. My mom wouldn't let me watch it when I was a kid, but I, I got to go back and I'll have to send you some quotes. So you might be getting uh, some funny LinkedIn messages from me, but always fun to follow you on LinkedIn. That is where you can definitely connect with Matt. Also, um, Give a a few other places if you've got some uh, to kind of send our listeners to. Yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I love connecting with with other folks in the the space. And of course, Sales Assembly, you could find out a little bit more about what we do if you're interested at salesassembly.com. Perfect. Look them up. Matt Green, thank you so much for joining me on this show and uh, looking forward to hearing about your travel next. So this has been a fun conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tim. It's great to be a part of this. To all of our listeners, uh, this is another episode of B2B EQ, and uh, looking forward to next time. Talk soon. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. 
To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.